deception that he got. What about yours? Same thing. Where at? Oakland Air Force Base, California. And what happened there? And just like Dave said, <laughs> he got a lot of, you know, name calling, you know, a lot of stuff thrown at you, garbage. You know, it just, it was, wasn't a good thing. Were there, was there more than just you that got off the plane? Oh, yeah, there was, yeah. There was a bunch of us that got off the plane that, you know, that they were all from Vietnam. What did you say? What did you say to each other when you, you saw that? Did you expect it? Yeah, from, you know, what we've heard, you know, what we heard when we were over there about coming home, how, uh, you know, how bad it was going home, you know, what kind of reception he got going home. It was just, you know, you kind of, you expected it. You knew what was coming ahead of time. So we all pretty much, you know, embraced for the worst, so to speak. When he got back to Wisconsin, to Watertown? To you know, Beaver Dam. To Beaver Dam. What were things like then as far as the reception? I had a lot of friends that showed up at the bus station down on South Street. Center. On Center Street, South Center, when the bus station, Greyhound bus station was there. I had a lot of friends that greeted me down there. So that kind of took away a lot of the pain that I got from Oakland. You know, seeing all the, you know, all my friends that are sitting there with a case of beer. You know. <laughs> they were ready for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> things have changed as far as attitudes towards Vietnam veterans, especially in the last few years? In the last few years, yeah, and especially after, like David mentioned, the uh, LZ Lambo up there at uh, Green Bay. That was, uh, that changed a lot of people's attitudes towards Vietnam vets, when they had, because that was all open to the public. Mm -hmm. And there was everybody from every, you know, every walk of life up there. You even had the Indian, you know, that Indian. That opened up a whole lot of eyes, because I, when I was up there for the three days, there was people, you know, just regular, you know, husbands and wives that weren't in the service or weren't in service, but they weren't associated with Vietnam at that time, had said, boy, you guys went through hell, didn't you? And I said, yeah, we did, believe it or not. <laughs> you know. Do you feel anybody else can ever understand and kind of feel what you actually went through when you were in those combat situations? Personally, no. I, I've talked to a lot of people, even in Beaver Dam, that the generation that grew up in the Vietnam era and the generation who grew up after Vietnam, like, you know, like high school kids. I've had a lot of high school kids ask me, what was it like over there? Do you tell them? I said, what do you want? Do you want me to paint your picture or do you want the truth? And they said, well, we'd like the truth. And I told them, you know, what I went through, what I seen, what I had to do when I was, a, you know, door gunner on a helicopter. And they'll go, and that didn't affect you? I said, at the time, no. I said, now that I look back at it, yeah, it did. Because I couldn't understand why they were so young doing what they were doing. You know, like being booby-trapped and, and coming up and blowing up, you know, pe you know s servicemen in, in a group, you know, <coughs> just in a village. Just unbelievable. But I had a job to do and I had to do it. And when I got back, yeah, I had nightmares about it off and on. It's terrible. I don't like it. You know, but that's one of the things that happened. And there's not a whole lot I can do about it. I can just live with it. You seem to be coping quite well. I do. I have a lot of support people around here, especially at the American Legion here and even with my family and, and friends. I have a lot of, well, I have a couple other friends of mine that are Vietnam vets that aren't here today, but we get together, we talk, which helps, you know, kind of smooths everything over so you forget what, what, you know, what was going on and we'll change the subject and we'll talk about something else so we're not totally <coughs> involved with what we did in Vietnam, you know. And there are a lot of people, when we do get together at restaurants, there are a lot of people that sit around and say, you guys were in Vietnam, what was it like? Well, we do the same thing. Do you want us to paint you a nice picture? Well, what all the fun things were that we did when we weren't on a mission? Or do you want the truth? Hey, we tell them, we tell them the truth. They start turning green. I'm sorry. I mean, they, they just couldn't handle a lot of the stuff that we that we were involved in. You know. You know, I didn't ask Dave this question. I meant to. How did you deal with the heat and the humidity over there? <sighs> Pretty much 
like you do on a summer day here. I mean, even it got hotter over there, and the, human, the humidity was worse than what it is here. Every day. But every you, day. You'd, yeah, you'd pretty much, you know, if there was a rain, that was a hot rain, but, <laughs> you know, and after that, it would be humid and all that. And those are yeah, you, tees, that's heavy clothing. Yeah, it is, but you got to walk around in t-shirts, or, you know, if you got real bad, you could take a t-shirt off and just walk around, you know, like you do every day if you were working out in your yard. You know, but yeah, we dealt with it, just the way the troops do in Iraq and Afghanistan. We deal with it. So, you know, didn't have a whole lot of air conditioning over there, except in the clubs, you know, <laughs> that was about it. What well, were your living conditions uh, when you got at your base? At the base, we lived pretty much in a tent, you know, six guys to a tent, three on each side, but we had, you know, tent and wood floor and refrigerator and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah that's, you know. What was a typical day like? Typical day, if we weren't on a flight mission, we were either working on the helicopter, making sure everything was up to, you know, up to snuff to where we could, you know, make sure that we had no issues of leaving, taking off. But we'd always, we'd always be there cleaning up, working on it, checking things over, greasing it up, you know, making sure you're ready for the next mission. Were the Huey helicopters pretty dependable in your opinion? Oh yeah, they were. I think some of them are still in service. I believe they are, yeah. I know they upgraded them quite a bit from the, from the Huey to the Black Hawk helicopter mm -hmm. and uh, their, co their, their addition to the Cobra helicopter. I think when they started the Vietnam War, the Huey really didn't have a gun. It, it kind of evolved during the yeah, Vietnam it War. It, it evolved back, well, actually, when the Vietnam, when we first got over to Vietnam is when they started developing the Huey as a, as a gunship and a troop carrier. They started making it so that they could have machine guns on both doors and then rocket, you know, rocket pods mm -hmm. on each side. Now, the troop carriers had machine door gunners. Yeah, too. they did. Yeah, they had to. They had door gunners. They had two, you know, one on each side. But they didn't have rockets on them. All they had were just, were just machine guns, six caliber machine guns. Gene, for those listening this afternoon, what what do you want people to know about your service? To realize that we fought for the right to keep our freedom, to keep their freedom, so that they would have freedom in the United States. That's basically. We weren't bad. We weren't bad troops. We were good. We did it. We did a job that we were put over there to do. Whether it be you know stuff that we couldn't talk about or stuff that we could talk about, to realize that we are just the same as as an Iraqi soldier or an Afghan soldier, you know, American soldier coming back with a lot of problems that we never got to deal with like they do today. Pretty much, you're here. This is your money. See ya. Gave you a steak and a, and a potato, and said, "There's your dinner for coming home." And that was it. You know, we did not get a whole lot of the uh, counseling and stuff like that that they do now today. Are there some things that you don't like to talk about? There's a lot of things I don't like. said before, they, they do bring back bad memories, they do bring back uh, you know, nightmares and stuff that I don't like to, I can't get away from it, it's going to happen. I don't know when they're going to happen, but you know, uh, they do happen. If I see something on TV that sparks a memory, or my daughter called me up the other night, I think Monday night, she said, Dad, there's a, there's a series on the History Channel about Vietnam. Yeah, I don't know if I want to watch that series or if I do want to watch it because I don't know what's going to happen after I watch it, whether I'm going to have a nightmare or if I'm going to be up all night. Well, <laughs> as it was, I watched a couple of them at night and I ended up being up all night because of bad memories, you know, bringing back experiences that I dealt with over there, you know, with someone like Hamburger Hill and, and Hill uh, 637 and, and, and that. Back a lot of bad memories, and I was up all night. <laughs> Have you seen Platoon? Uh, yeah, three times. Is there anything that uh, those of 
of us who have never served, never been in a combat situation that you can point to that you say, well, that kind of situation kind of portrays what it was like. Right. Platoon, the movie Platoon, when it was brought out, was, was depicted exactly how the ground troops and the infantry were in Vietnam, what they went through and what they, like Dave said, they had to call in fire on top of themselves just to get out of a bad situation. Platoon depicts that. Apocalypse now, eh, that kind of predicts a lot of what happened in Vietnam with the first cab like I was in, you know, with different situations. Uh, it wasn't all fun and games like they made it, you know, <laughs> as coming into a beach and then going out and going to surf. <laughs> right, with the music in the background. Yeah, the <laughs> right. The exactly. Well, we did have music on, there was one helicopter unit in our division that had uh, speakers to well that the purpose of that was is when you come into an LZ that was either a hot LZ with a lot of enemy you know circled around it, they'd blast the music to disorientate the enemy. So you know, because they were looking around, and by the time they got done figured out what was going on, we'd already be on top of them, you know, laying down cover fire for the you know the infantry troops that were coming in there to to take over uh, you know an area of BC or Viet Cong. Yeah, that, that part of it was, you know, depicted in the movie. But mm -hmm. yeah, Platoon, for the most part, actually depicted what actually went on in Vietnam with the infantrymen on the ground, in the jungle, what they had to deal with, like Dave said, from me to you is where the enemy were walking, a battalion or a squadron or a company or whichever. The Ho Chi Minh Trail. You'd blast a hole in the Ho Chi Minh Trail, like Dave said, they'd be back at night fixing it, but they did not depict they were outside that trail. They had other trails around that. They knew where, you know, where the bad spots were, like a bridge or where the, you know, where we were going to go in and attack the trail. They had already had trails outside of that as an escape route to get around it and back on the trail again with, you know, vehicles or whatever they were carrying. Yeah, they, you know, even in the movie, in the, in the uh, series about Vietnam, when they were talking about the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they showed access trails around everything that we bombed on the trail exactly. Which the next day, it like it never happened. Mm -hmm. When you see depictions of when those B-52s would carpet bomb that, that the Ho Chi Minh Trail, you just wonder, how could anything possibly survive that? Anything or anybody? Nothing would survive it. But they, you gotta realize that the BC and the Chinese had so many troops, North Vietnam, they had battalions and battalions of of their, you know, their troops, the Viet Cong, North Vietnamese, already stationed around, you know, in some of these areas. They knew where likelihood that we were going to bomb. They would be on the op they would be on the outside of that perimeter. Once it got bombed, they were back in there to fix it. But yet they had other troops carrying supplies around that spot that we bombed, carpet bombed, and like Dave said, you know, Dave said it would be back to operational the next day. They'd work on it overnight, even the bridges. You take out a bridge that you can see, visibly see, you take out a bridge by the next morning, that bridge would be up there and they'd be walking across it. It must have been frustrating. <laughs> Very frustrating. <laughs> Why are we doing this if they're gonna come back? It's like, you know, you throw a piece of bread out to a cat or a dog and all of a sudden the next day you go out there and you don't throw them anything and they're standing there waiting for it. It's, you know, it's frustrating. Very frustrating to see that happen. You, you think in your own mind, why are we doing this? Why did they make us go out here, bomb these bridges, bomb these areas, when the next day they're right back in operation again overnight? Very frustrating, you know. I asked Dave this question. I asked you, do you think militarily we could have won that war? Militarily, yes. If we would have been able to do it, you know, what they wanted us to do, yeah, we could have. To be honest with you, we never lost. That exactly. Was, never lost a battle. Mm -hmm. Right. From all the reading I've been able to do, it was the perception of Tet. When Tet occurred, when they got at the U.S. Embassy and the TV news got that, and then Walter Cronkite went over there right. and broadcast that the, basically the war is lost. And right. that, that just changed everything. Yeah, that changed the whole, the whole outlook of everything.